if you look around our society today and you think mm, things just aren't right, well, you're not alone. Western societies around the world are changing dramatically and often not for the better. We are becoming less tolerant in the name of tolerance. We are adopting and accepting ideas that actually eat away at the foundations of a Western liberal democracy. Hello and welcome to the Full Comment Podcast. My name is Brian Lilly, your host. And today our guest is Gad Saad, an academic and intellectual in the best sense of those words and someone who many of us have seen document the very issues and concerns that we're going to talk about today on his popular YouTube channel, on Joe Rogan podcast and elsewhere, as well as in his best-selling books. Dr. Gad Saad is a visiting professor and global ambassador for North Northwood University, and he joins me today. Uh, Gad, thanks for the time. Oh, I'm so glad to be with you, Brian. Thanks for having me. I, I want to open with a, a quote that I grabbed off the back of your best-selling book and, and recently became you know, a bestseller again, and we'll talk about that. But yeah. I grabbed this off the, the back dust cover, and I want to read it to you and have you react. And tell me if you still feel the same way. Okay. The back of the book, and I don't think this was you writing it. This is the publisher's promotional bit, but it, it's kind of summarized a lot of what you wrote about in the book. It said, the West's commitment to freedom, reason, and true liberalism has never been more seriously threatened than it is today by the stifling forces of political correctness. Now, that's from a book in 2020. In 2020, you said we had never been under more threat. Yes. Do you still feel that way or has it gotten worse? <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. Could you have imagined how bad it would be in 2024? I was trying to think where you were. I was trying to predict where you were going with this. No, it's, uh, I guess, one of the ways I could answer your question is saying that the book is still selling like hotcakes, which su suggests that w that what I hoped would be the final mind vaccine and inoculation against all this nonsense has apparently not sufficiently worked because uh, we are still facing the same issues, if not those issues having been exacerbated. So the book remains timely precisely because uh, the phoenix of woke parasitic ideas keeps rising from the ashes, despite the fact that I keep hitting it. <laughs> well, o over the summer, um, and as I said, you're, you, it came out 2020. I think the paperback early 2021. Um, uh, but this summer, you got a big endorsement. And I don't think you'd seen it yet. Elon Musk goes on X and, and says you must read this book. And, and, and I sent you a message and I said, I just said, how are sales going? And you hadn't seen it. Uh, I'm guessing they they took off just after that. They did. Now that just to, if I may correct you, it's it wasn't the first time that he had endorsed my book. He's been a, a fan of my work and of the, of the parasitic yeah. mind for a long time. But that specific uh, post, I, I shouldn't say tweet, that particular post, you are correct that you were the first one to bring it to my attention. I said, oh, let me go check. And uh, you are indeed correct that there is, I mean, more importantly than the Oprah bump, I think we need to revise our lexicon to the <laughs> Musk bump because the book then entered two weeks in a row. I, I think it was the Toronto Star uh, Canadian bestseller list. So you're exactly right. A book that was a bestseller four years ago returned to the bestsellers list four years later. Well, very well done. Walk us through uh, the parasitic mind, because there's been a, a lot of talk about that. I know that Musk has been a fan of your work and of the book, and he talks about the woke mind virus. And that can sound like it's, you know, sloganeering, it's jingoistic, oh, parasitic mind. Oh, but what is that? Yeah, no, so that's define a, that's it a, for me. Yeah, that's a great question. So let me give you sort of the background of how I developed the idea and then link it to the neuroparasitological framework. So the first time that I had sort of a Houston, we have a problem uh, moment was in my scientific work. So for those listeners and viewers that are not familiar with my work, I apply evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology to study consumer behavior, economic. And, and, and you've written books on this Previously. I've written many books. So yes, the consuming instinct right here, the evolutionary basis of consumption. This is an edited book. 
Go ahead. You've looked at how we react and interact with goods and why we purchase certain brands. And you've looked at that before. That That's where you came out of before you got as political as you are now. Right. But I was looking at the biological and Darwinian underpinnings of our consuming instinct, right? So for example, how do our hormones affect our food behavior? How do our hormones, you know, does a man's testosterone increase if he is using a, you know, driving a Porsche? I've, I've literally done those studies. How does a woman's it menstrual? Does it? it does. As a matter of fact, uh, so I did a study with one of my former graduate students and I'll I'll come back to the parasitic mind in a second. Uh, in 2009, I published a paper with uh, John Vungus, who was one of my former graduate students, where we actually got men to not imagine driving a Porsche. We actually rented, try, try to get a scientific granting agency to give you money to rent a Porsche for science. So we rented a Porsche and we had a beaten up old car. So one is a high status product, one is a low status product. And we had young men drive these two cars uh, either in downtown Montreal where, where everybody can see you and on a semi-deserted highway where few people could see you. And the dependent measure was we took salivary assays so that we could measure the fluctuation, the fluctuating levels of their testosterone. Because, and actually that's a good segue to eventually answering your parasitic mind question. So one of the things that I do as an evolutionary psychologist is I look at the behavior of other animals to draw homologies and analogies with human behavior. So for example, the peacock, right, has evolved this big, beautiful tail that's otherwise very cumbersome and costly, right? It's from a survival perspective, that peacock's tail is costly. It increases yeah. your chances of predation. But the reason why it evolves, it does so through sexual selection, meaning that it confers a reproductive advantage to the peacock in exhibiting that signal. So I took that idea and I said, well, surely human beings engage in sexual signaling, and I'm going to study it in the context of consumer behavior. And that's how I came up with the idea of studying it in the, in, you know, with using Porsche. So the Porsche is the human equivalent of the peacock's tail. So, so coming back now to the parasitic mind. So I realized early in my career that what seemed profoundly obvious to me, which is that human beings are biological beings. And therefore, if we want to study consumer behavior perfectly and completely, we need to study the biological forces that compel us to be the consumers that we are. Well, that was complete crazy quackery. It was neo-Nazism, neo according to many of my social scientist colleagues and business school professor colleagues. And so right there, I said, well, hmm, this is strange. How could otherwise supposedly sophisticated, intelligent, intellectual professors be such imbeciles? So that was my first exposure to how ideology can cause you to have completely irrational thoughts. So that was nearly 30 years ago. And then as, uh, as my academic career progressed, I saw the infiltration, the proliferation of these, what I call parasitic idea pathogens. But why do I use the framework to your very specific question? Why do I use the framework of parasitology? So in the animal kingdom, including humans, there is the field of parasitology, which studies how parasites interact with hosts. So for example, the, the uh, 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 tapeworm goes into your intestinal tract, but a neuroparasite ends up in your brain, altering your circuitry to suit its reproductive interest. And therefore I had my aha moment. I would then argue in the parasitic mind that not only can human beings be parasitized by actual physical brain worms like Toxoplasma gondii, but they could be parasitized by ideological brain worms and hence my neuroparasitological framework. And what are some examples of these parasitic ideas? Postmodernism, cultural relativism, social constructivism, radical feminism. Each of these parasitic ideas destroy the capacity of the infected person to think rationally. And so I go through all of these parasitic ideas and then I offer a mind vaccine at the end of the book. You know, as I'm thinking about, you know, cultural relativism, I was just trying to look up her name, the Iranian uh, dissident who lives in New York, 
Uh, she's had her life threatened. I'm, I'm sure you've seen her work. It's just her mind's escaping me now. And she's talked about that recently, about how we've got people in the Western world declaring themselves feminists, uh, but they won't speak up for the women of Iran who are being oppressed. They are fully on board with Hamas and Gaza and uh, denouncing Israel, which is a, a state that uh, actually puts these things forward. I said off the top, we have become less tolerant in the name of tolerance. Is that one of the, the parasitic ideas that you deal with? Oh, absolutely. Look, uh, so cultural relativism was an idea that was first espoused by a uh, anthropologist by the name of Franz Boas. And he wanted to create a new worldview of, of, of human behavior that abdicated biology as being relevant to the study of human behavior. In other words, uh, because a whole bunch of bad folks had misused Darwinian theory. So for example, British class elitists argued that, well, it's a natural struggle between the classes. We're the upper class. If the lower class has to die from a, a, a you know, a, pandemic of uh, tuberculosis and if they live in squalor and they all die out well that's just darwinian it's just the natural struggle between classes uh the nazis came along and said hey it's a natural struggle between the races we are the aryans sorry gypsies sorry homosexuals sorry jews it's time for you to go uh hey that's just darwinian now of course it had nothing to do with darwinian theory but because all sorts of political cretins were misappropriating evolutionary theory, some idiotic professors, as often happens the case, said, hey, why don't we create a new worldview of humanity that completely abdicates biology and evolutionary theory being relevant to human beings? Therefore, cultural relativism does exactly that because it says that there is no universal human nature. There are no universal objective moral truths. Every culture has to be ju judged based on the, idiosyncrasy the idiosyncrasies of its own cultural trajectory. Therefore, who are you, Brian, white guy, Canadian imperialist racist, <laughs> to tell us that the cutting off of clitorises of five-year-old girls is, is a bad idea? That's cultural imperialism. And that's, by the way, exactly what, since this is a Canadian show, so let's link it to, to Justin Trudeau. If you remember... When Justin Trudeau was a parliamentarian, before he became mm -hmm. prime minister, Stephen Harper's government had released a, 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 a sort of an edict or a, a pamphlet saying, look, we do not condone barbaric practices like genit female genital mutilation, child brides, yeah. uh, honor killings in Canada. And if you remember in a very theatrical and obnoxious, bombastic way, Justin Trudeau got on TV and kind of huffed and puffed and moved his hair and said, you know, I will not tolerate that these things be called barbaric. Barbaric. So yeah, he, he was upset at the use of barbaric, not the barbaric practices. Exactly. Well, what allowed him to have the goal to do that is precisely cultural relativism. Who are you to judge what others do? No, no, no. I will judge. There is no context under which cutting off the clitorises of little girls so that they could never experience fully the joys of intimacy is ever a good thing. So each of those parasitic ideas, Brian, started off in a university setting for a noble cause, right? So in a sense, I'm being charitable here. It's not as though the the people who espouse and spawn these ideas say, let's just destroy the edifices of reason just for fun. They usually start off with a noble reflex but then in the service of that noble reflex, if we have to murder and rape truth, so be it. I remember um, a, a colleague, um, this is going back years ago, I was in radio in Ottawa, and he made a comment that there was objective truth. And there were a pile of other people in the newsroom that couldn't believe that he said that. <laughs> and they said, no, there is no truth. There's only your truth and my truth. And that, well, no, but there there has to be a truth that we can have our views, we can have our opinions. But there, I mean, beyond cultural relativism, there is a a, a desire to say there is no truth anymore. 
And right, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful setup for my next anecdote. Maybe some of the viewers and listeners have heard it, but even if they have, it's worth hearing it again. And for those who've never heard it, okay. fasten your seatbelts. So the, the reason why I call postmodernism the granddaddy of all idea pathogens is precisely because that's the root parasitic ideas from which all of the other parasitic ideas can flourish. If we can espouse the idea that there are absolutely no objective truths, then you're not constrained by your genitalia when it comes to your, your biological sex. Who are you to say what constitutes male or female? As the most recent addition to the Supreme Court, when she was being confirmed and asked, what is a woman? She said, well, I'm not a biologist. Well, until 15 <laughs> minutes ago, until 15 minutes ago, the 117 billion people that had existed on earth were perfectly able to navigate through the very complex conundrum of what constitutes male or female, but she wasn't able to say did, it. Did you see the the head of the International Olympic Committee? Um, yes. Uh, he was at a news conference, and, and of course, there was all the debate about the uh, women's boxing and were there biological males in it? Was it, you know, they did not handle it well. They could have settled all the debate by being upfront and honest. So one of the journalists just asked a, a, a very relevant question. Will you handle this better next time? Will you find ways of talking to the public and, 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 and being upfront with them so that there isn't this controversy around uh, uh, sex? And he said, there is no scientific way to determine what is a man and what is a woman. Absolutely. This is the head of one of our biggest global bodies. Well, I was fortunate enough when I chose what I thought was a woman to start my family, and then we ended up having children. It's by the complete, complete vagaries of stochastic life that I ended up, <laughs> because I could have easily chosen a woman with a nine-inch penis to have children with, but luckily I came out on the right side. But just so that I don't leave your viewers and listeners hanging, can I go back to telling? Yeah, the yeah, story? go back to your story. Yeah. So the best way to describe what a cancerous form of intellectual terrorism, postmodernism is, to your point about your colleagues who were saying, what is this? There is no objective truth. In 2002, one of my doctoral students had just defended his dissertation. So we were going out to celebrate. And have you heard this story before? No. Or, or no? Okay, no. so no, no, I'm, go I'm glad because it's always exciting when someone hears it for the first time. Uh, so we were going out for a celebratory dinner, myself, my wife, my doctoral student, and he was bringing a date with him. So a few hours before uh, the date, before the dinner, he calls me up and he says, oh, I just wanted to give you a heads up that the, the lady that I'm bringing for the dinner is a graduate student in uh, uh, anthropology, postmodernism, and women's studies. And I said, ah, okay, so the holy trinity of bullshit. Uh, and so, but, but of course, the reason why he was calling me to say this is like, let you know, please, can we not get into this big, you know, I said, oh, no, no, I got you. I'm going to be on my best behavior Mum's the word, I'm going to be good, which of course was a complete and utter lie because about halfway through the evening, I turn to the lady and I say, oh, I I hear that, uh, you know, you're you're a graduate student in postmodernism. Uh, yes. Oh, so there are no objective truths, of course, other than the one objective truth that there are no objective truths, but never mind that internal mm -hmm. cognitive inconsistency. Uh, do you mind if I propose what I think are universal truths and then you, we can discuss it and you can tell me how I'm I'm wrong? She says, yes, go for it. Now, this is 2002. So this is way before the transgender stuff. Two yeah. This is 22 years ago. I said, is it not true that within homo sapiens, humans, that only women bear children? She looks at me, can't believe at what a simpleton I am and says, that's absolutely not true. I said, oh, what, what do you mean? How is that? How is that? She goes, oh, because there is some Japanese tribe on some Japanese island 
whereby within their folkloric mythological realm, it is the men who bear the children. So by you restricting the conversation to the biological realm, that's how you keep us, you know, whatever, barefoot and pregnant. So after I recovered from the mini stroke I had at listening to such gibberish, I then said, okay, well, you know what? Maybe it was too controversial, too incendiary for me to mention something as controversial as only women bear children. So let me give you another example, and then let's see if we can agree on this one. She goes, yeah, go for it. I said, is it not true since time immemorial that sailors have relied on the premise that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west? And there she used a variant, Brian, of postmodernism. It's called deconstructionism. It's Jacques Derrida. Language creates reality. So she said, what do you mean by East and West? And what do you mean by the sun? That which you call the sun, I might call dancing hyena, exact words. I said, well, fine. The dancing hyena rises in the East and sets in the West. She goes, I don't play those label games. Now that became known. It's, it's now part of the lore of the internet, the dancing hyena story. Why do I always recount that story is because it perfectly captures what happens to a graduate student at a leading, arguably the leading Canadian university who is parasitized by postmodernism. If she can't sit at a dinner and agree on the fact that women bear children and that there is such a thing as East and West and the I, sun, and the sun, what can we do? Like, where can we go from there? It's a, Darwinian epistemological dead end. There is no value to postmodernism, right? So that gives you a sense of why I wrote The Parasitic Mind, because yes, universities can be wonderful places, but they can also be where reason goes to die. But the, okay, so these ideas start in the university. Yes, sir. They don't stay there. It's not like a, you know, a bad weekend in Vegas. It doesn't stay in Vegas. It comes back with you like a venereal disease from Vegas, and it infects everybody. This so talk about how that has an impact on on the wider society because Western liberal democracies, I think, were going pretty well. We you know we had elevated society, um, and now we seem to be going backwards. And and, and so how do these ideas that infect the minds? just academics at the start, undermine our entire society. I love that you set, set up the question that way because one of the most frequent blowback that I would receive early in my career as I was standing on top of the mountain warning people is, oh, come on, Dr. Saad, why are you exaggerating? So there is some esoteric department in the humanities that is promulgating these ideas. So what? It's not going to make it to medicine. It's not going to make it to mathematics. It's not going to make it to the business school. I said, no, exactly to your point. I said, the virus eventually breaks free from the lab as we think we know with the lab leak theory of COVID. So yeah. yes, you're right that the dreadful parasitic idea starts off in some nonsensical department in the in the humanities, but it doesn't stay there. You know what it becomes eventually? It becomes the prime minister of Canada, right? So you're exactly right. Bad ideas don't have a geographical limitation. That's what makes them so dangerous. That's why I repeatedly say in my social media engagement, and earlier you mentioned Elon Musk, he completely agrees with me. We've had private conversations where we've confirmed this to each other, where there is nothing more dangerous in on earth than a parasitized mind. Yes, a tsunami can cause great devastation, but that's a quote act of God. But most of the tragedies that are imparted throughout human history start off with a bad idea, right? There is a little Austrian guy with a small mustache who said, hey, you know what the big problem in in our culture is, it's the cancerous parasitic Jew. And if we only excise that from our society, then we will all live in a utopia. And a bunch of people said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, Adolf. So, 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 so to your point, 
that's why I stood up and kept screaming and screaming because I knew that those ideas were going to eventually escape and become our journalists, our pop culture, our actors, our prime ministers. And so, yeah, that's that's what happens when bad ideas infect entire societies. Uh, Gad, before we jump back into the conversation about uh, parasitic ideas and uh, how they don't just stay in the sociology department somewhere, you've got a new title. You're visiting professor and global ambassador at Northwoods University. Uh, I don't know Northwoods University. Uh, give me a uh, give me your elevator sales pitch on this. What are you doing there? What what? Tell me about this change. Yeah, so uh, I was approached by the president of Northwood University there in a. Apparently, I, I, I haven't yet gone in person. I will be going soon in person to to meet the folks. Uh, they're in Midland, uh, Michigan. He approached me and said, "Look, we're we're big fans of your scientific work and, of course, your free thinking. Uh, we are known as the Free Enterprise University, so their entire, you know, ethos is rooted in freedom. And we would love to see if we can uh, work together. And so." In, in all frankness, I, I had never heard of uh, Northwood either, but boy, am I glad that I now have because, uh, you know, it's it's really, we're all human beings. And, and so we'd like to say that, you know, hey, I nothing phases me and so on. But you also want to be at a place that shares your uh, general sense of how a university should be run that is not infested with parasitic ideas. And so... It's been very, very refreshing for me in the in the few weeks that since I've joined them to be able to interact with people, you know, who I don't have to discuss whether the sun exists or not, or whether it's called dancing hyena or not, or I don't have to do land acknowledgements before saying hello, and I don't have to submit a diversity, inclusion, and equity statement before I apply for a grant. So it's been very, very liberating, and I really look forward to my uh, visiting professorship there. Well, let me know how uh, Midland, Michigan is. Uh, beautiful part of the, uh, the I haven't stopped in Midland, but I love that the area of that uh, right. part of the state that it's in. So I'm sure you'll Lovely. enjoy it. Uh, and go in the fall because, you know, campuses in the fall. There's just something picturesque about it. That's uh, exactly what the president told me, by the way. He said yeah. that we want to get you here before winter breaks, precisely <laughs> for the reasons that you said. So we were talking about parasitic ideas. We were talking about how uh, they don't just stay in the sociology department. And I, I want to give you one glaring example. Uh, and then you know we can move from there into what happened to uh, Jordan Peterson and the College of Psychologists a little while ago. But this is this is actually from uh, one of the organizations that determines uh, uh, how doctors are trained in this country, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada put out a, a notice a little while ago that they want to change how medicine is taught and practiced. And it said, quote, a new model of can meds would seek to center values such as anti-oppression, anti-racism, and social justice rather than medical expertise. I don't give a flying you know what about my doctor's political views. I want to know, are they competent? Now, my, my GP, I happen to be friends with, and we share political views, but I, I really don't care when I'm being treated medically, how they view uh, you know the, the state of Canadian politics or what have you. I want to know, are they competent? And these guys want to put everything else ahead of competence. Yeah, that's uh, I've, I've actually weighed in on that exact new training of Canadian physicians. Look, there, there are certain professions and cer certain bodies the FBI, ju judicial system, the medical associations that should transcend politics, right? I mean, that's right. The Hippocratic Oath should be first do no harm. Now, of course, the woke physicians will say, but no, I, we are doing no harm by teaching you about anti-oppression. No nonsense, right? If so anti-oppression comes before your ability as a physician to perform an operation, you're doing harm. You're exactly right, all right? So look, uh, I mean, that issue arises not only in, you know, at that, you know, with physicians, it, it starts at the, the first point where, for example, they're now arguing that the grading 
of physicians when they're in medical school creates undue pressures and stress on physicians. And therefore we should move to a more empathetic pass fail system so that people are not competing against each other and worried. Guess what? I want my emergency room physician who by definition is facing some of the most stressful moments where this, the decision tree that he or she follows over the next five minutes will cause that child to either die or not. I want them to have been exposed to stressors, right? Seneca in, 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 my ha in the happiness book, I talk about anti-fragility, which is a term that was coined by a fellow Lebanese, Nassim Talib, right? Seneca, the ancient uh, philosopher, Stoic, said, I'm paraphrasing, that the strongest trees are those that have been exposed to a lot of wind stressor. Therefore, their bark and their roots are stronger. The trees that haven't been exposed to wind stressors end up being brittle and they break and they, they right? So let's apply that the concept of the wind stressor to your physician. Do you not want them to have faced stressors so that they can be trained to deal with stress? So not only are you infusing to your, to your original question, all of this woke nonsense in the practice of medicine, but just in the original training of physicians, you're incorporating this very loving, I love you, you love me, we all win trophies. No, we don't. I want the physician to have suffer during medical school because that makes them anti-fragile. At the medical school level, here's just a couple of things. This is from uh, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Jamie uh, Sarkanak at uh, National Post. She writes about the University of Calgary created a special admissions pathway for black students, entitling applicants to have their admission essays evaluated by non-white assessors. McGill, the University of uh, Alberta and Dalhousie have all done the same uh, and similar routes are being opened up for indigenous students. Uh, I'm all for having diversity in terms of who's getting into medical school, but it, it is an insult to indigenous and black students to say, well, you should be held to a lower standard. It, indeed. I mean, it's, it's, it's simply, isn't it? Do you wake up in the morning, Brian, and say, I simply, I mean, I wrote the parasitic mind and I don't cease to be amazed every day at the level of collective lunacy that we are seeing. It's really breathtaking, right? Because you'd like to think that there's there are certain ideas that were defeated. Let's say judging people based on immutable traits. We call that racism. We call that bigotry. And we did a great job over the past 100 years to remove those systematic barriers, right? And of course, that speaks to I know you know this, but maybe some of your listeners and viewers don't, the distinction between equality of opportunities and equality of outcomes, which, of course, the current contender for the presidency of the United States, Kamala Harris, doesn't seem to understand that difference, right? She believes that to the extent that there is any differences across people in terms of, the, of, in terms of outcomes, it must be a nefarious cause that created that difference and therefore we need to fix that so that we all end up at the same final place i mean those are literally almost her identical words you know what creates equality of outcomes socialism and communism right but yeah we all end my, up poorer and more we oppressed. all end up poor we all end up at the same bread line we all end up as as hungry as each other we all end up dying of famine together equally dead from the famine as Lysenkoism showed during the Soviet Union era, right? Because the argument there is there are fewer women who are professors of mathematics at Brown University. Aha, that's where the park, the, the patriarchy is demonstrating its machinations. It, but it never goes the other way. Uh, when I was a kid, there were un, a lot more men as teachers. Elementary schools are 85 to 90 percent women as teachers. Um, you always found more men in high school teaching positions, but even that is shrinking. Uh, there are fewer men in nursing. Uh, nobody says we've got to get more men into these professions. <laughs> yeah, it, well, that, not, not only that, Brian, once the patterns of the, of the narrative of oppression is no longer present, 
people don't adjust their priors. So let, let me explain that. That sounded like a lot of fancy talk. So let me break it down into a concrete example. There used to be a time where women were discriminated from entering veterinarian school and from entering medical school and entering- When, when, when my mother came here in 1968, she had been working on computers in the UK. She got to Canada and was told, oh no, ladies can't do that job. I'm not, I, you know, I'll never say there was not discrimination and oppression and things to change, but we've got exactly. a weird view of it. So now let's fast forward to today. So I would, I would receive at my university endless emails you know, how are you going to be an ally to women? What's your contribution to allyship to women? As if the email was happening while we all lived in Waziristan and the tribal territories of Pakistan. Now, let me draw the line of what the current data shows. So this is from US data, US government data, looking at four levels of educational attainment. So in the US, you have what's called an associate's degree, which is like half a bachelor's, imagine like community college. So there's associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, and doctoral degree. So there are four levels of educational attainment across five racial groups, whatever, uh, Hispanic, white, black, and whatever. So there are five. So, th so the matrix is a four by five matrix, okay? In each of those cells, the government has provided the ratio of male to female, right? So let's assume we were the time when your mother came, or let's go further back to make to, to go back to when there was real full on orgiastic discrimination. 20 out of the 20 cells would have shown that men outnumber women in each of the 20 cells. Yeah. Guess what the current data was? Go give it to me, Brian. Oh, it's all women. 20 out of 20 cells. Women outnumbered men. So let, let me, I, I get, I'm not trying to talk down to your audience, but it's important to, to explain. Meaning that I couldn't make up data that were that was more of a falsification of the narrative that women are being held back in universities. Therefore, it offends me as a professor of 30 years to receive an email of how are you going to be a better ally to women? My dean is a woman. This is at my home university. My chair is a woman. The associate dean of research is a woman. But yet I'm being sent emails as if I lived in Waziristan, Pakistan. That's the dishonesty of the woke narrative, which is it is impervious to incoming new data that the victimhood narrative must persist. La, la, la. I don't want to hear of any progress. What's the anecdote? Is there an anecdote? I mean, it, it, I know you've got anecdotes in your, or uh, antidotes, sorry, I'm saying anecdotes. What's yeah. the antidote? I'll learn to speak one day. Uh, English is my second language, I guess, uh, after Glaswegian. Uh, the, you know, how, how do we cure this? You, you put the book out four years ago. It hasn't worked, Gad. <laughs> well, I, I'd <laughs> like to say- Give me little work. <laughs> I, I mean, it has worked in the sense that I receive, I mean, literally receive thousands of emails from people saying, I was the biggest blue haired walkster possible. Then I read your book. I started consuming your content. Thank you so much. So, so in the grand scheme of things, I haven't been able to administer the vaccine and all stupidity has ceased to exist. And I don't think any mind vaccine could ever do that because regrettably, I think the architecture of the human mind is built to be parasitized. The, the only thing that's unique about the current period are the specific idea pathogens that we are now seeing, right? Cultural relativism was not an idea pathogen 500 years ago, but there were other idea pathogens then, right? A pope, oh, you, the, you look look back to the 1930s. They thought eugenics was great. Even, even Tommy Douglas did his, um, his thesis on, you know, sainted Tommy Douglas did his thesis on eugenics exactly. in favor of it. Exactly. So yeah, so, bad ideas have been around a long time. So bad ideas are around. It, regrettably, there's always an allure to these bad ideas so that they can quickly infect and parasitize many human minds. There was a time where we threw women into the water and if they swam, they were 
witches. And if they didn't and drowned, then oops, I guess they weren't witches. <laughs> and people thought that that was a great test to do. That was a diagnostic test to determine whether my neighbor Angela was a witch or not, right? So, well, so it was, we've, we've done that to Dr. Jordan Peterson. <laughs> we have, by we the way, him in the water, he swam, so we must be a witch, and he's got to go to a re education camp. Have you seen the clip, the satirical clip that I released where I feigned that the Ontario College of Psychologists has had declared me as his re education mentor? Have yes. you seen that clip? Yes. I mean, that that's now, I think, my second or third most viewed clip of all of my clips. So, this demonstrates to you, by the way the power of satire, sarcasm, and humor, right? Because the dictators don't usually eliminate the guys with the big muscles because we can handle those because we own all the guns. I'm speaking now if I were the dictator. The guys that really are dangerous to me as a dictator are the guys with the sharp tongues, the guys with the sharp pen. Those are the bastards that I have to eliminate. So the satirist is the biggest danger to the dictator. We have He, he goes first to the chopping blocks. So oftentimes I will get some smarmy, obnoxious professor that I'm talking to who tells me, oh, but you know, aren't you demeaning your professorial uh, you know, image when you do all of that satirical stuff? I say, absolutely not, because I'm in the game of trying to persuade people to better think. I will use any weaponry within my arsenal of weapons to try to achieve that goal. Sometimes I will be professorial. Sometimes I will be scientific. Sometimes I will be uh, satirical. All bets are off when it comes to trying to change human minds. Well, you know, we're seeing in the United Kingdom um, what we're worried about here, and this is something that Elon Musk is fighting back against. He has definitely turned Twitter, now X, around in terms of being a place for free speech. Uh, we just had Mark Zuckerberg admit that, yeah, he had downplayed the Hunter Biden laptop story, and he was smothering true things that were being said about COVID at the behest of the government the Biden administration, because it went against their uh, their views. But in the UK, we're seeing people being arrested for memes posted on Facebook. I'm worried about that coming here if we don't have a change in government. Um, that sort of thing, you know, if you had told me 20 years ago, in Britain, they'll be arresting you for jokes, I would have laughed. I mean, the, the cradle of the, the, the best of Western civilization comes from the UK. The the, the Americans, Canada, the Australians, New Zealand, we all draw inspiration from there. And they are now once Great Britain. Yeah, I mean, life comes at you fast to your point about how quickly things change. Uh, I have a quote in the parasitic mind. I don't have it in front of me, so I don't, I'm going to sort of paraphrase it. Ronald Reagan famously said, and I'm sure you, you probably know which passage I'm talking about, where he, he basically said, look, every generation, there has to be an assiduous fight for freedom and freedom of speech, because the bad folks are always coming to bring down those, those uh, majestic, you know, foundational values that define the greatness of the West. And so... In the past, we had a stronger sense of our identity so that we were able to push back against intrusions against freedom. But because of all this cocktail of parasitic ideas, there's no longer any defense against it. So that a place, as you said, a cradle, the bastion of the Western tradition, Britain, is now looking more like Orwell's worst nightmare. And if I may, I don't think I've ever mentioned this to uh, in, our, in our, I didn't mention this in our last conversation, there is a distinction in, in ethics between deontological ethics and consequentialist ethics. And I'll, I'll link it back to, you know, the 11 year old that's being arrested in Britain. So bear with me. Deontological ethics refers to absolute statements of, of ethical conduct. So for example, if I say it is never okay to lie, that would be a deontological statement. Consequentialism, on the other hand, is another ethical statement that says that you judge the morality of an action based on its consequences. So then if you say, it's okay to lie if you're trying to spare someone's feelings. And so I often joke that if you wanna have a long, happy marriage, if you ever hear the following question, do I look fat in those jeans? Put on, the, put on your consequentialist hat very quickly, <laughs> okay? Now, for many, many things in life, we are all consequentialists and that's perfectly fine. But, so now I'm gonna tie it back to your original question, 
when it comes to foundational values that define the Western tradition, those by definition have to be deontological. If you say something like, I believe in freedom of speech, but the second you say, but you're a degenerate asshole, because what's going to come after the but is going to be exactly some consequentialist ethos. Yes, you should be able to criticize religions, but you should maintain group cohesion or community cohesion. That's what causes people to then argue that Islamophobia should be a hate crime. No, no, no. In a free society, as long as it's not defamation, libelous, you know, incitement for child pornography, direct incitement for violence, screaming fire in a theater, there are, all bets are off. I am Jewish with a very, very tragic childhood in Lebanon. And yet I support the right, Brian, of Holocaust deniers to spew the most offensive and insulting stuff humanly possible, which is the rejection of a historically documented reality where an entire people were dis uh, extinguished. I support their right to exhibit such offensive language. So that's the problem of what's happening now in Britain. They've put on a consequentialist hat when it should be the deontological framework that originally made Britain great. Well, you and I will uh, continue to be out there on the good fight, pushing back against bad ideas. Uh, we could talk for another hour, but I know you've got another appearance to make. So, Gad, thanks so much for your time. Keep up the good fight and, and let's keep in contact. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. Full Comment is a post-media podcast. My name is Brian Lilly, your host. This episode was produced by Andre Pru. Theme music by Bryce Hall. Kevin Libin is the executive producer. Remember to hit the subscribe button, whether you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube Podcast, now a thing. Uh, make sure you leave us a review, share it on social media, tell your friends about us. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Brian Lilly.